Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar, which is the seventh of the Development Matters series supported by Irish Aid. My name is Rachel Nikelik, and I'm delighted to chair the session today. We're, we're delighted to be joined by Ms. Hannah Tate, Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General to the Horn of Africa, who has been generous enough to take time out of her schedule to speak with us today. Secretary, Special Envoy Tate will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then we'll go to a Q&A with the audience. You'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they come up, and we will do our best to uh, answer as many as possible with Special Envoy Tate. Um, just a reminder that today's session and the Q&A are both on the record and are being recorded. Please feel free to also join the discussion via Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce uh, um, Special Envoy to the Secretary General today, and then I will hand over to uh, Michael O'Toole from the Horn of Africa, who's the Horn of Africa Director at Irish Aid, who delivers some opening remarks. But first, a note on um, uh, Ms. Tate, who was appointed as Special Envoy to the UN Secretary General to the Horn of Africa on the 1st of April 2022. Prior to this, she served as Special Representative of the Secretary General to the African Union and Head of the United Nations Office to the African Union. She also served as Director General of the United Nations Office in Nairobi. Ms. Tate has held a variety of senior level government positions, having served previously as Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration of the Republic of Ghana. Ms. Tate was previously involved in high-level mediation activities when she was appointed co-facilitator facilitator in the high-level forum for the revitalization of the agreement for the resolution of the conflicts in South Sudan. Most recently, Ms. Tate was part of the African Union delegation mediating the Ethiopian Truce Agreement. I would now like to invite Michael O'Toole, Horn of Africa Director at Irish Aid, to deliver opening remarks. Michael, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you very much to the IIEA for organizing this um, important and interesting series of lectures. Um, we had Minister Colin Brophy yesterday speaking about the food crisis that is devastating many parts of the Horn. And today it's a real pleasure to be uh, hearing from Hannah Tate. As you've been uh, just saying, Rachel, colleagues will know that um, Hannah was appointed as the Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General to the Horn of Africa earlier this year and prior to that she served as special representative of the Secretary General to the African Union and as you've been saying she of course previously served as Minister for Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Ghana. I think it's safe to say that she knows the Horn of Africa as well as anyone. Um, today she is going to speak about the recent cessation of hostilities and peace agreement in Ethiopia that agreement was, of course, very welcome coming after two years of appalling conflict in northern Ethiopia, which left hundreds of thousands of casualties, severe human rights abuses and blockages of much needed humanitarian assistance. Um, I would also say that Ireland played an important role over the past two years during our membership of the UN Security Council in ensuring that the Council maintained a focus on the situation in Ethiopia and we consistently urged an end to the conflict, um, unimpeded humanitarian access, dialogue to resolve issues and accountability for human rights violations. So I think it'll be very interesting to hear Hannah's assessment of the agreement, its implementation, and perhaps the role that the international community can play to support the agreement and ensure there is no return to violence. So with those brief remarks over to you, Hannah, thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you very much, Michael. And um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be with you um, this afternoon from Addis Ababa. And very many thanks also to IIEA for organizing this event and for their kind invitation. As I'm sure you're all aware on the platform that on the 2nd of November, the federal government of Ethiopia and the Tigray People's Liberation Front signed the agreement for lasting peace through a permanent cessation of hostilities. And that took place in Pretoria in South Africa. Now, the permanent cessation of hostilities agreement, while it is an important first step in the 
development of a peace agreement. I think it's important to point out when you look at the text that it envisaged other discussions and negotiations to take care of other aspects of um, disarmament, demobilization, reintegration, um, dealing with the political, outstanding political and governance issues between the two parties and so on and so forth. And so this is a first step in a series of steps that are going to take place. So I don't want it to be considered as a final document. It is a foundation document, but it is not the only agreement that I think the two parties are going to have to negotiate between themselves. Now, as per the Pretoria Agreement, senior commanders from the two sides met five days later. And after several days of follow-on discussions in Nairobi, they signed the declaration of senior commanders on the modalities for the implementation of the agreement for lasting peace through a permanent cessation of hostilities on the 12th of November. Since the 30th of November, the Technical Planning Joint Committee comprising representatives from both sides has been meeting in the town of Shire in Tigray to work out a detailed plan for the disarmament of Tigrayan combatants and other related matters. In parallel, the TPLF announced on the 1st of December that the Tigray army had started withdrawing from several formerly active front lines. We have conflicting reports on the withdrawal of Eritrean forces, though it appears to be the case that they have also partially withdrawn, though the exact figures have not been verified. I attended the Pretoria talks as one of the three observers, alongside the IGAD executive secretary and the US Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa. And following the 2nd November signing of the agreement, I've continued my engagements with the two parties, with the African Union Commission, with the African Union High Level Panel that were the, if you like, mediators and facilitators of this process and relevant stakeholders, including representatives from the government of Ethiopia. Continued efforts are required to build positive momentum further and implement the agreement for permanent cessation of hostilities and also to make sure that as these follow-on discussions take place, agreements can be arrived at that can be implemented within a reasonable period of time and will continue to build confidence between the parties. We are only at the beginning of the peace process. And this is going to require strong political will and constructive discussions between the parties to implement the Pretoria Agreement. And there will need to be on both sides, pragmatism and some level of flexibility. So far, the political will to implement the agreement is evidenced on both sides. And the international community should encourage and support this in order to facilitate the successful implementation of the agreement. Constructive engagement from and between the AU high level panel and the international community, and of course, the two parties to the agreement will be key to ensuring adequate support for the peace process with an emphasis on leveraging our respective strengths and capacities to support successful implementation. The Pretoria Agreement may provide increasing opportunities to support with funding and sustain peace and development gains within Ethiopia and within the larger Horn region. And so I'd like to reflect a little on the implications for the Horn of Africa. If, and I expect that it will, implementation continues to move forward as evidenced over the last few weeks, Northern Ethiopia's peace process will likely stabilize the broader Horn of Africa region. And the reason why I refer to Northern Ethiopia is because this was a conflict that involved the region of Tigray, the region of Amhara, and the region of Afa. And communities in all of these three regions have been significantly impacted by the conflict. And so the peace building process will necessarily, while focusing on Tigray, has to be focused on more than just Tigray in order to make sure that there is a lasting end to this conflict. The bilateral relations of Ethiopia with its neighbors can certainly benefit from greater peace and stability in the country. And for Ethiopia, I think that it will allow it to be less inward facing, 
even though there are still some ongoing smaller scale conflicts and challenges elsewhere in the country that also demand attention and sustainable solutions. My expectation is that engagement of Ethiopia with its neighbors will be on a bilateral basis. There are multilateral structures, of course, within IGAD the, and also within the African Union, but these are more complex. But the optimism that has been generated since the Pretoria Agreement could have a positive ripple effect on issue-based cooperation within the regional architecture. And within the regional architecture, I'm referring to both IGAD and the African Union. We saw recently, and this was during the COP27 um, uh, summit, that there was consensus between IGAD member states on the development of a coordination mechanism to deal with the challenges of the climate crisis, which was endorsed by the IGAD Council of Ministers about a week ago. And it is encouraging to see that there is agreement between the member states of the region on focusing and working together on issues where they are facing a common threat. Regarding bilateral relations, however, I expect that in the relationship of Ethiopia with Sudan, we've already had more positively evolving relations, high level contacts between Ethiopia and Sudan increased in the second half of this year. The prime minister, Abiy Ahmed and General Bohan, the chairperson, of the Sovereign Council of Sudan met on the margins of the EGAD summit in Nairobi on the 5th of July and were able to agree to address their differences on the Al Fashaga border bilaterally and without further escalation. Um, there were also meetings between the two at the Tana High Level Forum on Security in Africa in mid November. And there have also been follow up discussions between the PM and other members of the Sovereign Council. And most recently, the Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister traveled to Khartoum to attend the 48th ordinary session of the IGAD Council of Ministers. And the two countries have agreed to solve disputes peacefully and enhance cooperation on bilateral and regional issues. And we've already seen that in terms of their engagement. That of course may create openings for them not only to deal with the challenge within the Alpha Shaga border area, but also as further discussions continue on the water management within the context of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Um, the Pretoria Agreement may also help Ethiopia, again, give the space for increased attention to cross-border security cooperation with its other neighbors. And uh, I would specifically refer to Somalia. Earlier this year, there were incursions of Al-Shabaab into the Somali region of Ethiopia. And um, we saw that there was strong collaboration between both sides in responding quickly and decisively. And given the fact that there will be less focus on the conflict in Northern Tigray because of the peace process, I think that it will create the space also for increased cooperation between the Ethiopian government and the government of Somalia in addressing the, uh, the threats posed by Al-Shabaab. I'm sure you would all have realized that over the last couple of months, the new government of um, Somalia has been focused on fighting Al-Shabaab and dislodging it from as many of its locations as possible. And that then surely should help to also increase, because of this increased collaboration, between the two sides that had happened even before the Pretoria Agreement, it is my expectation that they will continue to work together to be able to deal with their mutual terrorist threats. With regard to economic cooperation, of course, the peace in Ethiopia will also create more opportunities for economic engagement with their small, much smaller neighbor, Djibouti. The two countries um, have strong economic relations because Ethiopia relies on the port facilities in Djibouti and consequently Djibouti gets a significant amount of its revenue from the Ethiopian use of its port facilities. And I expect that they would be looking forward to an upsurge in economic activity now that the peace process is underway. And so in conclusion, what I would say is that this agreement 
provides the basis for a nascent peace process that now has to be protected and sustained with patience, with endurance, and with pragmatism, implementing a step-by-step approach. One must not forget the other parts of Ethiopia, such as Oromia, where challenges remain and conflict continues. If we can work together, the Ethiopian government, working with the TPLF, working with, through um, the regional multilateral organizations, the United Nations, and other partners to support this peace process and to increase co- the confidence of the parties in the fact that this can actually happen and be sustained, I think that one of the most significant conflicts on this continent that have been going on over the last two years would certainly have been not completely addressed because there are still political issues that need to be dealt with between the parties. But at least we would see peace, stability, and normalcy return to the Tigray region, which has been under blockade for quite a number of months now. Um, Since the agreement was signed, I must also add that my colleagues who work in the humanitarian space have been able to deliver both food and non-food items continuously with the facilitation of the Ethiopian government. There has been, there is ongoing a process of restoring services to um, different parts of the region. It is also the case that um, the fact that this agreement has been signed has created some relief among the population in Tigray and optimism. And the fact that they think that they now have the chance to look towards a better future. We will continue as the United Nations to scale up humanitarian deliveries, humanitarian access. When the parties finally conclude their agreement on demobilization, disarmament and reintegration, if they request the assistance of the United Nations, which has not happened yet, of course, we would be in a position to be supportive of this process. We have had some inquiries regarding support for demining activities within the region, which we're in a position also to support. And we look forward to continuing to do what we can, knowing that in this particular instance, because the population is exhausted, the delivery of humanitarian assistance is not just a necessary intervention to provide relief, but is also an important confidence building measure. And in fact, was the incentive, I think, on the side of the TPLF for having agreed to the cessation of hostilities agreement in the first place. And I hope that I have been able to give you a broad overview and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Tay. Um, I'd like to invite people who are joining us on the webinar to submit questions. Uh, There's a message in the chat you'll see to submit your questions uh, via the Q&A function. But to start off the discussion, I'd love to uh, get your opinion on the steps, building on what you've just touched on, what steps can the international community take to support the truce agreement at this point? Thank you. What is clear is that there needs to be additional funding to be able to support the humanitarian deliveries. There are significant challenges all over Ethiopia, not just in Northern Ethiopia. For instance, within the Somali region, large populations have been impacted by the drought. That is as a result of the climate crisis. And so my colleagues in the humanitarian space have been doing quite a bit of deliveries over there, not just within the Northern region of Ethiopia. And so the point I'm making is that the demands are very high. As I said, the agreements are still in the process of being other follow-on agreements are still in the process of being negotiated. So once we have clarity on what the parties have agreed on regarding DDR, we'll also have a better understanding of where the entry points could be for support from um, the international community in order to make sure that those agreements can also be effectively implemented. So I would say that for now, the clear need is for scaling up of humanitarian assistance and also for some support for post-conflict reconstruction, especially with regard to the restoration of services. Because it was last week, I think that there was um, the restoration of electricity across the national grid in Mekele. 
but that meant that the substation in Alamata had to be repaired in order for that to happen. So as a result of the conflict, there's quite a significant amount of infrastructure across the region that has been damaged. And therefore, just to be able to facilitate the humanitarian delivery and to, again, as I said, restore a sense of normalcy, some support for those quick interventions to be able to support the region, I think it will also be critical going forward. Thank you so much for that. There's some questions coming in from the audience uh, from Suzanne Keating. Um, what role do you see for local civil society to help ensure a just peace in Ethiopia and the region? And the second part to that question, how is the UN promoting and involving local civil society, including women peacemakers? Thank you. So for now, for now, the engagement has been mainly with the Ethiopian government and with the TPLF. Again, because of the stage we are in the process of negotiating this agreement. But when it comes to sustaining peace and further peace building efforts, especially across communities, there will be the need for engagement, not just with government actors, regional actors, but also civil society actors. And I know that my colleagues who are working in the country team are quite cognizant of that and have developed a plan for the post-conflict um, initiatives. Now, I also know that there are a number of committees that have been established by the government that essentially are going to oversee the implementation of different aspects of this um, process. There certainly is, and that is a discussion that is ongoing with the government and with my colleagues in OHCHR, issues relating to, trans to um, transitional justice and accountability. That is still very much a work in progress, but that goes to the point that I was originally making. What we have so far is a start. We're going to have to continue to build on it. And of course, with, if we don't involve civil society actors and communities, we're not really going to be having an effective peace building process. So at each stage, there will be, I think, the opportunities for greater inclusion in order to make sure that there is a lasting peace but we are not at that stage at the moment. Thank you so much for that. There's a few more questions. And I'd just like to invite the audience, if you do have more questions to put them in the chat. Um, there's another question uh, in relation to the conflict having a disproportionate impact on civilians, particularly on women and girls. And how is your office working with other UN agencies in Ethiopia to strengthen the protection of women and girls? Thank you. The impact of the conflict on the civil population was enormous. And as was stated in the question, women and girls have been very much on the receiving end of that process. And that's the reason why um, my colleagues in UNFPA who are providing support to women and girls who have been impacted um, have very much stepped up their activities within the region and have had support from the government of Canada to be able to do so in a, a, a more significant fashion. And so for the last, the agreement was signed, as I said, on the 2nd of November, um, about two weeks later was when we actually started moving things into the region. I'm, I'm just trying to make sure I get my dates, trying to get my dates right. Um, there has been a scale up of support activities across the different agencies, funds and programs as access has been made available to us. And my anticipation from the conversations I've had with colleagues in the country team is that they are going to do more of this. And as I said, in the case of um, the impact on women and girls, because UNFPA has already received some support to be able to do that, I expect that they're going to be scaling up their activities quickly. Thank you for that. Um, there's, there's quite a number of uh, uh, questions coming in now. The next question is on um, the role that reform of Ethiopia's federalism or constitutional provisions on federalism play in promoting greater harmony or stability. The Ethiopian constitution and its particular model of federalism, ethnic federalism, is a subject that has attracted significant debate 
and discussion among various um, stakeholders within Ethiopian society over the last couple of years. Some see it as um, an important structure for greater, if you like, equality among the different groups. Some see it as the root cause of the conflict between the different ethnic groups within the country. So it's a mixed bag. But my understanding is that the national dialogue process that is anticipated to begin at the beginning of next year is supposed to create the opportunity for a nationwide discussion because it's envisaged that it will be held um, not in one location, but through the national members of the National Dialogue Commission interacting with different communities to be able to get a sense of what the countries, what the people of Ethiopia think about the system of government they have, about the issues that are most critical for their national discussion at this moment and their views on what should be the way forward. And I think it's an important discussion to have and it should be well managed in order to make sure that it, has, is, it is reflective of as many shades of opinion as possible so that there can be a disaggregation from that national conversation on what would be most acceptable for the citizens of the state as the reconfiguration of the constitutional arrangements or perhaps the maintenance of the existing arrangements with some tweaking. But um, it is my anticipation that it is that process that is going to create the opportunity for a meaningful discussion among the Ethiopian people on the way forward, as long as, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm giving this caveat, it is managed properly by the um, chair of the National Dialogue Commission and the commissioners who are responsible for getting this off the ground. And picking up on, on that point in terms of um, uh, looking at the impact of the conflict on civil society, and thank you for your answer on women and girls. There's two questions from Noreen Gumbo, Gumbo from Trokra that are connected. And the first question is, um, did the parties consider the deep psychological trauma of this conflict on local populations in the North and also countrywide? And how will this be addressed? Uh, and the second question is around the restoration of banking services uh, and other services in Tigray. And you'd mentioned that in terms of the importance of peace, stability and normalcy and re re restoring services. So it would be really interesting to hear your views on how those issues were, were considered in negotiations. Thank you. Okay. So let me refer to the agreement itself because I think it's um, useful to deal with the, with the text. So if you could just give me a minute while I um, refer to the appropriate paragraphs. So regarding the protection of civilians in Article 4, it says the party shall protect the human rights of the civilian population and commit to upholding applicable international humanitarian law instruments to which Ethiopia is a party. The party shall in particular condemn any act of sexual and gender-based violence, any act of violence against children, girls, women, and the elderly, including recruitment and conscription of child soldiers and support family reunification. Then there is a provision on um, how they will deal with transitional measures. And I just want to refer to Article 10.3. The government of Ethiopia shall implement a comprehensive national transitional justice policy aimed at accountability, ascertaining the truth, redress for victims, reconciliation and healing consistent with the constitution of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia and the African Union transitional justice policy framework. The transitional justice policy shall be developed with inputs from all stakeholders and civil society groups through public consultations and formal national policy making processes. So I said at the beginning that this agreement envisaged further discussions going forward 
on how to deal with some of these issues. And this is one of them that has been provided for. And my colleagues, again, within the country team and with OHCHR have started working with the government in the preparation of this issue. Thanks so much for that, Ms. Today. Uh, I'm going to go to a question now from um, uh, Mahari Gebru, who is a, a, an LLM candidate at the Irish Human Rights Commission. Um, uh, do you foresee an arrangement by the UN or the AU to address accountability for those crimes committed during the course of the war? Yes, and that's what I just read out. That is the transitional justice mechanism that is that both sides committed, because after all, this is in the permanent cessation of hostilities agreement. Both sides committed should be established through public consultation in order to make sure that there is that accountability. And moving on then, thank you for that. There's a question in relation to uh, Al-Shabaab and also a question in relation to the role of Eritrea in the conflict. So perhaps we could take that question first. Can you comment further on Eritrea's role in the conflict and the current Ethiopia-Eritrea relations? So Eritrea was not mentioned in the agreement and there's no reference to any Eritrean involvement in the conflict. Though, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we are aware of the presence of Eritrean forces within um, Tigray, even though the information we have suggests that there has been some withdrawal to within their border. Um, in the second agreement, that is the Nairobi Declaration, it refers to the withdrawal of foreign forces and it makes this, um, it, it anticipates that this will go along also with the process of disarmament. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, discussions relating to disarmament are the discussions that are taking place at the moment. So what it appears to be the case is that, and I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully, what appears to be the case is that the Eritrean government has taken, has noted the peace agreement has begun to move backwards. It seems that the relations between the federal government of Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, I'm not sure the, the appropriate word to use, but let's say that they still continue to engage each other because it appears that they were collaborating in this conflict. As to what it will be going forward, I think it depends very much on how this agreement is implemented. And um, of course, to, to uh, uh, make sure that there isn't a situation where there is the continued, if you like, um, imposition of violence on the people of Tigray by any Eritrean forces from either within the region or moving from their border into um, the Northern region of the country. So I think it just is a situation that we will have to continue to observe in order to have a better understanding of what's going on. Thank you so much for that. Um, the question on Al-Shabaab then, uh, given the relatively large scale Al-Shabaab offensive, which took place in July of 2022 in the Southeast of Ethiopia, are you concerned that there may be more concerted attacks? And are you concerned about Salafi jihadist activities in the Horn of Africa more generally? So there's two big questions there. I think that there's a number of reasons to be cautious. And that is because the pressure that the Somali government is putting on Al-Shabaab clearly has the organization on the back foot. Of course, they are trying to um, recover and at the same time to launch counter offensives where they have the opportunity to do so, but they really are under pressure. And that has implications both for Ethiopia and for Kenya. I think it's because there is also the possibility that that may impact the movement of or there may be Shabab fighters who may also try to enter Kenya through their border with Somalia in the same way as they are doing, they have tried to do with Ethiopia. But what is also clear is that among the countries of the region, they are very much alive to the challenge and they have developed 
effective coordination mechanisms with exchanges of information so that they are able to collaborate with each other on the fight against Shabab and other terrorist organizations. I think it's important to note that within the Horn of Africa region as a whole, the, for the most part, those who practice Islam do so in peace and according to the tenets of the religion. It's not an aggressive religion. People like Al-Shabaab and other um, jihadists are very much on the fringe. They are not the mainstream. And indeed, there is a desire among um, many of the countries within the region to have effective cooperation on this issue, precisely so that it does not continue to become a national threat or escalates further. I think that they have been able, as I said, to develop mechanisms to this extent. I think what is more of a threat at the moment is not so much the, uh, even though terrorism continues to be an issue, is more the effect of the climate crisis and its impact on populations than terrorism. And I'm saying that because we've had six years in a row of bad rains. And so in Somalia, in the Somali region in Ethiopia, in the Northeastern region of Kenya, in the area we refer to as the Madeira Triangle, all of these countries are seeing the impact on populations and large populations and pastoral populations on the impact of the droughts and the loss of cattle, the loss of livelihoods. And so it's important that I think, while we recognize that terrorist activities are a threat, we should also realize that the ineffective response so far in dealing with the climate crisis is creating more of a threat to communities and creating even sometimes you do even say the incentive for people who are desperate and who feel that they don't have choices to engage in those kind of activities. So we can't just address the threat of terrorism without, within this region, carefully paying attention to the impact of the climate crisis and supporting countries to be able to deal with mitigation, adaptation and resilience. That's so important. And Ireland had tried while they were on the Security Council to, to raise the climate and security issue um, at, at council level. Um, there's a question also uh, from COP27. Um, a loss and damage fund was agreed. And I think you've, you've, you've already hinted on your views, but what are your views on, on the fund? And what opportunities and challenges do you see this fund bringing to the Horn of Africa region? Thank you. Well, in the first place, who's paying for it? Because I don't think that was agreed. And so until we are very clear on exactly how this fund is going to be established, what the mechanisms for accessing the fund are going to be, and we don't know how long it's going to take to put that together. It will be an important development, but not a development that can have its impact actualized. And I think the countries of the region are not waiting for the fund, even though it's, as I said, an important outcome. Many of them are dealing in their own way with the climate crisis. And there has been a response across Ethiopia, Kenya, um, Uganda as well. Um, in Somalia, they've appointed a climate envoy because they recognize that they have to prioritize issues relating to mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. So if climate financing that is already available can be accessible, to the member states of the region to deal with these issues. It will help to deal with some of the displacement and the fragility that already exists. But of course, once the establishment of the climate fund, the loss and damage fund um, happens, I'm sure that it will be an important intervention, again, for countries that have been very much on the receiving end of this climate crisis. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're coming close to the end of the session. So I just remind people, if you have any further questions, to put them in the chat. But Ms. Today, I have two more questions. And um, this is a very broad ranging discussion. The first question, which I think you've already referenced, but this is a more specific uh, question, is on the, the UN and the international community view on the involvement of foreign forces in Tigray. Well, this has been a civil war that has been particularly bloody. 
there's no war that is a good war, right? And so therefore we are very encouraged by the fact that there is a peace process now to build on. And what our focus is on is to work with the parties to make sure that we can help them to consolidate that peace and to be able to rebuild and to reopen Tigray to, and re to, help for have the re to have the region reintegrated into the rest of the country. And of course, there is no place for foreign forces in the region, especially now that we have a peace agreement. And so we are, are very much looking forward to the outcome of the party's ongoing negotiations on how they intend to deal with the demobilization and focus on the reintegration of those fighters into Tigrayan society. But I think that there's a larger question because there has been a huge mobilization across the country for this um, conflict over the last two years. And so there, there may be a wider question of demobilization that um, would have to be addressed, not just with the Tigrayan forces, but with other regional forces that were also part of this conflict. I mentioned at the beginning that this did not just involve Tigray, it also involved Amhara and Afar. And so it's a broader context that we have to deal with in order to make sure that the peace efforts so far are sustained. And if I can just ask you on demobilization, what uh, successful examples will be drawn on for that exercise, which will be a big and expensive exercise to undertake? Every demobilization effort that I'm aware of within this region, perhaps one of the more recent ones being with South Sudan has, as you said, been a very big and expensive exercise. But it's, it's anything I say at this point will be speculative until we see what the party's agreement is. And so I don't want to run the risk of saying it could look like something and then, you know, we find out that actually there's much more, um, there's so many more different dimensions that need to be addressed. So I think for now, I'm not in a position to respond to that with um, any level of specificity. Thank you. And, and just to, to go back to um, broader issues, but I, I noted in your, in your um, words, you had used optimism and encouragement. And perhaps last Friday was a very encouraging moment for the humanitarian community when the UN Security Council adopted uh, the resolution on creating a carve out of UN sanctions regimes. Um, it's a critical step that will enable unimpeded delivery of food, medicine and humanitarian aid where it is supported and, and implemented. And what, do you, what impact do you think this will have on countries in the Horn of Africa, but also what are the obstacles that will have to be overcome to make this a really valuable um, uh, change? Thanks. For the countries of this region, we're dealing with complex transitions. We're dealing with a transition process in South Sudan, which is very much a work in progress. They had the agreement for the resolution of the conflict. They had a transition period, which they have extended for another two years. So it's not exactly within that environment anticipated by the most recent resolution, because there is a greater level of certainly not, um, I don't want to say that there's, there's a complete return to peace within the country because that is not the case. There is fighting taking place in different parts of, of um, South Sudan, but it is not at the level of the full scale conflict that we saw in 2013 and that we saw in 2015. So we're not dealing with the same dynamic. Um, if you're looking at um, Ethiopia, thankfully we're at the beginning of a peace process. So we don't see that having the same kind of impact. If we're looking at Sudan, we just recently have had a political agreement signed by um, um, different political actors looking to establish a new um, transitional government. So I think within the context of this region, we're not seeing the kind of situation that may have this resolution immediately impacting um, the challenges that we're dealing with in the Horn. Of course, if you were talking about DRC, given the recent escalation of violence in DRC, it would be a different dynamic. Or if you are talking about the Central African Republic, for instance, again, it would be a different dynamic. 
but specifically to the Horn of Africa, we are in a situation where the countries of this region that have had issues with political instability are dealing with what I would call complex political transitions. And the role of the UN and other international actors is to see how best we can support these transitions and make sure that we can move from fragility to stability and hopefully strengthening governance and uh, making sure that there are more inclusive political systems so there isn't a return to conflict further down the line. Thanks so much, Ms. Today. And the last question um, is, could you comment on Ireland and Ethiopia relations and the importance of having an elected member of the Security Council keeping Ethiopia and the region on the council agenda? Thanks. Well, the fact of the matter is that the Ethiopian government has not been happy with being kept on the council agenda. As a matter of fact, they have taken offense and they consider that um, this, that the different multilateral structures looking at issues relating to subsidiarity and complementarity should have been engaged. In other words, the African Union ahead of the UN Security Council. And remember that they have always said ahead of the negotiation of this peace agreement that they wanted African solutions to an African problem. Now, of course, the TPLF did not have the same perspective and wanted to have more of the international community involved in helping to get to a resolution of this agreement. So I think that the, I'm sure that you would know better, but I, I would suggest that the the relationship between Ireland and Ethiopia has been a bit bumpy as a result. But uh, I hope that going forward, as we now have a peace agreement, that there is the opportunity to build a stronger understanding between the two countries at the bilateral level and to put the past um, behind you, as it were. But for countries that are non permanent members of the Security Council, I think that the challenge across the continent, but across the world, is that very often when conflicts erupt, there are very few entry points. And the tools that are available to the Security Council to deter this kind of conflict are becoming more limited because of the internal divisions on the Council. And so the question really is, what is the most effective mechanism for dealing with this situation and getting to peace as quickly as possible? And how as the international community can we get around that and work together to support that in order in this particular instance to make sure that we sustain the peace and that going forward, there's not a return to conflict. Special Envoy, Hannah Tete, thank you so much for your time and for your uh generosity in answering a very diverse way of questions this afternoon. We're going to wrap up um, the, the webinar at this point. Sincere thanks to the team at the IIEA and also to Irish Aid um, and Irish Aid support for the Development Matters series and to you all for your questions. So a uh, special envoy, I do genuinely thank you for your time and for your excellent work. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much, bye-bye. Thank you very much and bye-bye.